I think that lack of a biblical worldview and the consequences that we see in culture are driving church leaders back to say, you know, I think our primary objective is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, and that equipping has to be with truth. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Framework Leadership, a podcast about how to you know, take your leadership to a new level each and every day. I'm your host, Ken Engel, president of Southeastern University. And I'm your co-host, Michael Steiner, vice president for innovation. And we're excited today for our guest to uh, have with us Doug Clay. Doug serves as the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, part of the largest Pentecostal denomination really in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's an incredible author, speaker, leader, and pastor with passion for serving the local church. It's great to have you here today. Hey, thanks, Ken. It's great to be on campus. Uh, I, I want to open up our conversation by talking about uh, Christianity today. According to the Pew Research Center, if recent trends in the religious uh, landscape continue, Christians could make up less than half of the United States population within a few decades. Why do you think there has been um, a decline in religious affiliation and church attendance in, in our nation lately? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I'd like to dissect that stat because mm -hmm. I suspect if you ask students on this campus if they would believe that, the answer would be no. No, right. right. And as I see the landscape, there is a lot of spiritual life activity happening in a lot mm. of communities. So are you talking about the institutional church or are you talking about the, kind of the biblical church, the body of Christ mm -hmm. at large? Right. But I think... Um, you know, COVID helped us do a, a good reset. Prior to COVID, most evangelical churches got really good at building an attractional model mm -hmm. of doing church. Yeah. But when COVID hit, the attractional model shut down. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so um, what are you left with? A, a deployment? And I think that also sort of just surfaced our need for strengthening biblical literacy. And yeah. I think what happened then, you went through COVID, you went through all the race stuff, you went through the economics and the political, and that was just an exposure that maybe some of the preaching pre-COVID focused more on how do you feel than what do you know. Mm. And But I am very encouraged because I think next generation, most church planners today are pretty expository in yeah. their approach, yeah. and, and it's the building of a biblical worldview. You asked, what do I think is the reason or the cause? I would say we went through a season of time where Bible engagement wasn't as important as, say, koinonia Absolutely. or community. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so when things happen, their worldview is not shaped on Scripture. It's shaped on political ideologies, right. news broadcasts that they're connected with. And I think that just kind of shook, mm -hmm. yeah. shook the church. Right. Well, and I think what's fascinating to me is that we were in the conversation before the show started talking about the Assemblies of God in particular, right? How you said, I think the average church attendance is, is 35. So how, are, you know, we see this, there's national trends, but how are things happening in the don denomination? What do you think is the difference there? And why are we seeing that kind of growth at, at that engagement level? Yeah. I think you have a younger generation that's really leaning in to experiential, mm -hmm. you know. They're they're leaning in not so much to traditional practices that have been brought down. Yet, out of their experience, it's amazing how much of the traditional practices are like, hey, we're into that. We yeah. want that. So um, I would just say that I was saying mm -hmm. prior to the show, if we were to break down our fellowship in decades, 20s to 30s, 30s to 40s, 40 to 50, 50 plus, I am most encouraged by 20 to 30s, yeah. hands down. Absolutely. You know, they're cause driven. Yeah. Uh, their first question in a job interview is not, what's the benefit package? They wanna know how can they make a difference. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And yeah. you got students on this campus that are changing the world by establishing 501c3s in their dorm room. Right, right. 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 And cause oriented right. things. So, so right. I think harness that. And, yeah. and I would say, particularly in our tribe, um, having space and place at key leadership tables yep. is common for young people to be there. Mm -hmm. It's common yeah. to... Um, I know in my life, I'm trying to adopt an Earl Kreps phrase, I really want to be reverse mentored. Yes. I, I, 
I throw mm. my PowerPoint slides by a younger generation. I throw mm. the wording of certain things, yeah. and I'm watching that happen. And yeah. as that does, people who are in key executive ecclesiastical positions, that's just going to trickle down. Yeah, I love it. So if, if we've got a young student, you know, they're graduating, they're in their first career, and they're looking for a church home, or they're wanting to find a place, how do they get involved? Like, what advice would you give them as they're looking for that family and uh, trying to get back into that, in that community and that yeah, step? There, there are three things that come to my mind. Number one, don't rush it. Mm. Don't take just what's open. I'd rather you not be in a position of ministry than to be in the wrong position of ministry. I think secondly, um, in this quest of understanding God's design Mm. for your life, His divine design, differentiate between calling and assignment. Your calling is for a lifetime, but your assignment is for a season of time. And I think some churches have lost their missional fruitfulness because leaders have hung on too long. Yeah. <laughs> Their assignment was done and they didn't recognize and they kept feeding it. I think the third thing I would say is um, just get comfortable in your skin, mm. not with who you are, but who you're not. Right. right. The more you're comfortable with who you're not, the whole Ephesians 2, 10, mm. you're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That's a unique to do good things that he's prepared in advance to you mm. to do. So... My deeds are not the same as President Ingalls' deeds. Your deeds are not the same deeds. So get into the sweet spot of knowing what are those deeds that he has for you and enjoy it. Yeah, Just enjoy the journey. Yeah, well said. You know, when it comes to our our missional passion and drive, of course, you know, to to preach the good news and and make disciples and, and, and be salt and be light... Uh, but we live in our context and in, in our, our our nation it, it, right now. There is such a division in in many ways, and and when it comes to navigating tensions, for example, between faith and politics in America, how can we, uh, as Christ-centered people, contribute to constructive dialogue and understanding where we can be great yeah. salt and light? I just wrote an article on that uh, following the first. Republican national debate and kind of like, here we go. I think two things come to my mind, President, is number one, lost people are not our enemy. Mm. And people of a different stripe. I think too often, you know, Christ created humanity in his image, and every human being has the right and has the ability to accept God's love in their life. But Culture, as well as the church, has a tendency to put labels on people. We label you according to your ethnicity, Mm. according to your religiosity, according to your gender, according to your political affiliation. And what happens, that label sometimes creates a barrier for us to just be neighborly, to be godly. Now, obviously, as a Christ follower, I have deep concerns about issues. I have deep concerns about the cultural shifts in in our iconic um, institution, social institution, political institution, family institution. But forgive the simplicity here, I haven't heard a trumpet blast yet. Mm, So that means the church is still in business. So I think we got to be very conscientious how to contextualize culture Mm -hmm. and then incarnate the truth into culture Mm -hmm. rather than just booing and hissing at culture and labeling and then losing our opportunity to reach them. Well, and I think what's been really cool about your leadership especially is that emphasis on biblical literacy, bringing that back to the church. And we're seeing that across the board with our extension sites and the different pastors Mm -hmm. we're looking for, this deep hunger to be like, what does the Bible actually say? How can we go across there? And so, you know, what you you made comments in the past and we talked about it, how pastors are more willing than ever, even these younger pastors are more willing to be more expositor, to to lean into these issues, to have the conversations. Why are they able to step in that now? And what does that mean? You know, what advice would you give to a pastor who's like, you know what, I think I need to start leading into that in my leadership? That's a great uh, question. I, I think we've all seen the consequences Mm-hmm. of people, even in the church, not having a biblical worldview. Yeah. Mm, yes. And that gets exposed during a political cycle. Right, right. That gets exposed during a, um, a social, cultural issue that hits their community. So I think we can't assume, you know, when, when I was in youth ministries mm-hmm. and had the little 
bracelet. You could start talking to somebody from John 3.16, for God yeah, so loved them. Right. You know, today you got to go to Genesis 1. <laughs> right. In the beginning, God. Can I talk to you about God? And, <laughs> right. and so I think that lack of a biblical worldview and the consequences mm -hmm. that we see in culture are driving church leaders back to say, you know, I think our primary objective is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, and that equipping has to be with truth. Yeah, I love it. I want to transition our conversation a little bit and talk about uh, your education. Uh, you graduated from Central Bible College, yeah. Springfield, Missouri. In the long run, how did how did Christian education ultimately prepare you for your calling and, and how you would serve? Yeah. Boy, thanks. It was invaluable. I reflect on those days. And I would just say not only did my formal education prepare me for my calling, but my continuing education as a general superintendent, you know, um, I have an organizational coach just because mm -hmm. some of us step into roles. I'm, I was in youth ministries. I knew how to do Carmen human videos. That was kind <laughs> yes. of my specialty, man. Yes. You know, Lazarus Jesus. And then all of a sudden oh you gosh. lead an organization yep. and people ask me all the time, is the national office with about 600 employees, are you, are you a ministry or a business? And I say, yes. yes. <laughs> you know, it's both. And, but I, I think what, what my undergrad education did for me was help me to establish some healthy disciplines mm -hmm. and to give me an appetite to know what learning could do so that at age 60, I still feel like I'm learning. I still feel like, I'm, uh, you know, wow, I, I, I've got to I've got to dive into this particular subject and make sure that I am mm -hmm. biblically, theologically, culturally sound in leadership. So mm -hmm. it set me up, simply put, to be a lifelong learner. Yeah. That. yeah. That's so and that's something we talk a lot about here, right, is that is that everybody needs education, right? Obviously, we work at an institution where that's the, what, the main thing that we do, but no matter how you get your education, you need education in order to continue to grow, and that appetite matters a lot. What advice would you give to, you know, kind of the other, we have a lot of Assemblies got institutions, right, in different ways, educational institutions. How, what kind of advice would you give them for fostering that appetite in young people? How would they, how do you grow that? How, how have you seen I, that? I think I would ask faculty, administration, and staff to model it. Mm. Just yes. model it. Yeah. You, you know what? Undergrad education, I, I completed my syllabus to pass the test to get the credit. Yeah. I can't do it that fast at this point. I, mm -hmm. there, there is greater at stake than yep. just passing sure. a course. So I appreciate it, but I think that's where faculty, administration, and staff can model the joy, the mm -hmm. passion, the, the significance beyond just public persona of what it means to be a lifelong learner. I love it. Yeah. We're going to move into our fire round, and, and we're going to ask you a few quick questions surrounding kind of everything we've discussed. I want to grab a few practical, applicable uh, pieces of advice from your experiences for our listeners. So I think we have just three quick questions. Michael, fire away the first one. Love it. Love it. So if you were you know, sitting down with a parent uh, in, our, in our tribe, in our movement, and they were asking, okay, should I send my student to one of our Assemblies of God institutions? What kind of advice would you give them? What, what, how would you respond to them? Absolutely. That? Yes. Yeah. Culture is our greatest advertisement right now. Mm -hmm. So do you want them to be an education where there's not a biblical worldview taught or where a biblical worldview is taught? And I think hands down, it would be a Christian education environment. Love it. How can our uh, ministry leaders be effectively equipped to lead this next generation? Uh, uh, get to know them and allow yourself to be mentored by them. Mm -hmm. Just put yourself in a position where a younger perspective is helping to shape your perspective. Yeah. I love wow. It. Love it. So good. Last question to close out our round today. If you could go back and tell your 20-year-old self one thing, what would it be and why? Yeah, life's long. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, you think about we're told so much. Life goes so quick. Life's like, Right, right. Uh, I had no idea when I was 20 of what I'd be doing at 50. And it's a long life. Wow. So don't wig out when some of the catastrophes, when some of the interruptions, mm -hmm. when some of the relational yeah. struggle, it, it's a long life. And stay on the journey and God will ultimately get you to the destination that he's put in your heart. Yeah. 
Well, Doug, thank you for joining us today. What a privilege to uh, have conversation with you. Grateful for your passion, your love for the local church, the way you're serving and equipping and, and the vision that you have. Uh, we're just grateful. So thanks for joining us today. Thanks, President. Yeah, if you want to stay up to date with Doug, you can follow him on Facebook and at Instagram at Doug Clay AG and on X at Doug Clay. You can also listen to his podcast, Your Day, where he shares stories of encouragement, visionary leadership, and kingdom accomplishment from leaders who are part of the Assemblies of God. Thanks for joining us today. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today on Framework Leadership. If you're watching on YouTube right now, now would be a great time to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button so you can get more leadership content right into your YouTube feed. You can also check us out on Instagram at Kent underscore Ingle at Dr. Michael Steiner or on Twitter and YouTube at Kent Ingle. And hey, if you love great email newsletters, and I know that I do, you want to check out the Framework Leadership Newsletter. Every single Friday drops in great tips to be a better leader, resources, thoughts right into your inbox. Check it out. You can sign up at kentingle.com. Make sure you hop on to there. Thank you so much for listening to Framework Leadership. Take care, everybody.